And if you jump across a branch cut, you face a function discontinuity. That's the most important thing. And if you want to maintain continuity, you have to go to the lower rebound sheet. This is the thing I want you to recall. Okay? So you can pass this around.
Okay, and everything on the right hand side is on the top three months sheet. So jumping across the branch card gives rise to a functional discontinuity. It's no good. So I would rather say if I want to maintain functional discontinuity, I will have to go to the bottom remind sheet. And then I go below the branch card. Okay, instead of jumping over, I go below it, as is denoted by that uh, sheet over there. And then the mapping will continue in this manner. Okay, so if you stay below the branch card, go below it, you will maintain functional discontinuity. The function does not have a discontinuity here. So if you keep marching, say if you reach the point D, okay, you will map to a point something like this. Something with half the angle over here. And then if you keep marching, okay, to a point A prime. But A prime is not actually the same as A because A prime is on the bottom Riemann sheet. So that goes to, uh, that is uh, that is 360, so it should be 180 degrees over here, right? So I, I did something wrong. So the point B is uh, 270 divided by 2 is uh, over here, right? The point B should be over here, sorry. And the point, the point A prime should be over here. Okay? The point B should be over there. The point A prime should be over there, and if you keep marching, you will still be on the bottom Riemann sheet. Okay, then you reach the point B prime by adding another 45 degrees here, so the point B prime will be somewhere over here. Okay, and then you keep marching, you will still be on the bottom Riemann sheet. Okay, and then you reach the point C prime. C prime will map to the point somewhere around here. Okay. Then you have the juncture of hitting the branch cut again. You have the you're on the bottom Riemann sheet, you have the option of staying in the bottom Riemann sheet by not climbing across the branch cut. You can go across the branch cut from the lower Riemann sheet to the upper Riemann sheet. And you will emerge from daylight. Okay, you were in darkness just now, now you emerge from in daylight. Okay. So this point should be somewhere if I add another uh, point, this will be D prime. D prime should be somewhere around here. Okay. D prime is somewhere around here. And then since I'm on the top remind sheet now. And go back to A. And meet up with A. Okay, this is how the mapping goes. So it's very important as to how you cross the branch cut when you encounter the branch cut. Okay. So any questions on Riemann sheets now? Is uh, this clear? Yeah, this was clear, but how do you choose the number of Riemann sheets? How do I? How do you choose the number of Riemann sheets? Oh, okay, uh, it depends on the two. number of values a function has. This is called a multi-value function. Okay? And it turns out that this is the double value function. It has only two values for every value of z. So you need two Riemann sheets. However, if you have a function like this, okay, f of z is like this. This is called a multi-value function because you can add, you can have infinite number of phases Z, uh, e to the i theta plus 2n pi, and it's still the same point in the complex z plane. This is still the same number on the complex z plane, okay? No matter how many n's that you add to it, it should be an i over here. But then, according to the rule of rocket rhythm, this should be i theta minus i 2n pi. So you can have infinitely many values for this function. So this is called a multi-value function with infinitely many values. 
To describe this function, you need infinitely many Riemann sheets. Okay? And if you have a cube rule, then you will have three Riemann sheets and so on. Okay, this is just a square root. Is this clear? Okay. This is very clear then. Very good. So we go back to the Sommerfeld identity and the Sommerfeld branch cut. We have this identity that this is equal to that function. Uh, maybe let's put something like that. Okay, we derive this identity, convince you that it's correct, and you have a homework to play around with it as well. Okay? So, however, this is a multi-value function. Kz itself is equal to k naught square minus k rho square. This function is not precisely defined unless you define this double value function that you have in there. Okay? And we went through some labor in the last lecture and show that if you look at this function and assume that k naught has a complex number and k rho has, is a complex number, okay, we identify that on the complex k rho plane consisting of imaginary part and real part, that the place where imaginary kz equal to zero, this place is a good place to define a branch cut because then you need two Riemann sheets to define this function because it's two values. Okay? And if we define the two Riemann sheets to be that the top Riemann sheet has this property, the bottom Riemann sheet has this other property, then this is a very good property to have. It means that radiation condition is satisfied, that the wave decays with distance as the wave leaves the source. Okay, this is the meaning of this wave. So we found that that branch cut looks something like this. Is it? Rectangular hyperbola. Okay, it looks something like that. That is the imaginary kz equal to zero line. Imaginary kz equal to zero line is there. But however, this is a double matching. If you go the other way around, you will see that k rho is also equal to k0 squared minus kz squared. So for every value of kz, there are also two possible values of k rho. It turns out that there is also another branch cut over here, which also is having the property that uh, imaginary kz equal to 0. Okay. And then we define the upper Riemann sheet to be the mapping of this KZ plane. So if this is a KZ plane, this is a KZ double prime, this is a KZ single prime. So we use this to map to the upper Riemann sheet. Okay. And then the bottom Riemann sheet will map to the Low bottom Riemann sheet. The lower half plane will map to the bottom Riemann sheet of that. Okay? Then this function is uniquely defined. And it will be uniquely defined. And it's kind of difficult to visualize this, but you can think of a branch cut as taking these two points in a complex plane, taking, think of this as a rubber sheet. You think of this as a rubber sheet. So you take this rubber sheet, take this thing, and then stretch this complex plane together. Take this thing, bend it by 190 degrees, and then sew this end to this end. Sew them together. 
Okay, you sew them together, then you get this picture. So think of this topological mapping. Can you visualize this mapping? Take this rubber sheet, take this thing, fold it, and then sew this thing to that thing. You get that topological sheet. Okay, can you visualize this in your head? It's a kind of topological thing. Think of this as a rubber sheet. Take it, fold it, and then sew it. So this thing to that thing. You can also think of it that way for this picture over here. You can think of that line, this line, if I were to draw this line with arrows, okay, you can think of that line as being the same as this line. You can go through it carefully. Okay, I wouldn't go through it very carefully. That line there will map to this line if you wish. Okay. I believe it will map to this one. Yeah. Because this line is the imaginary KZ equal to zero line. Okay. That line is the imaginary KZ equal to zero line. It will map to that line. Okay, that line is also imaginary KZ equal to zero line. But it has to fold around because this ray axis maps to that line over there. And similarly, there's, because of this double mapping, okay, for every value of kc, there are two values of k rho. That line also maps, there are two maps on, on there. Okay? Can you see the mapping? And now you have to imagine your, your mind now. Think of this thing as a rubber sheet. Okay? Take this rubber sheet and stretch it and bring this two things together and so Okay, think of it that way. Then you will see that um, how the quadrant map. Actually, the imaginary axis here will map to somewhere there. Okay, you can show that this is the real kz equal to zero. This imaginary axis here is just a real kz equal to zero line. And then uh, let me make sure that I'm absolutely correct before I provide you with the answer. So, can you see that? Uh, then, if this is the first quadrant, okay, and this will be the second quadrant, and then the second quadrant will map to this section over here. Okay, we see where the this line is and where this line is, then this must be the second quad. Okay. And similarly, this also is the second quad. Think of a rubber sheet stretch. Okay. And then over there will be the first quad. Okay. You can think of this as the first quadrant because this first quadrant must lie between this line and this line, okay? And then you can also show that this is the first one, and this is how the rubber sheet mapping goes. This is how the rubber sheet mapping goes. So is everything clear? Then if this is clear, then we are armed with ways to do things that are very interesting. Um, we could also, uh, I think we show that this is equal to i over 2 minus infinity to infinity d k rho, k rho over k z, h 0, 1, k rho, rho e to the i 
A, B, and C, right? We show that this was true. And because we show that this is, is true, we can do an interesting thing with it now. That this integration can be made to appear different by a change of variables. Okay, if I do a change of variables to that integral, that k rho squared is equal to k0 squared minus kz squared, then I have 2k rho dk rho by a change of variable. Okay, if I were to change of variable and try to make this into the kz integration, I have 2k rho dk rho is equal to minus 2kz dkz, which means that dk rho k rho kz, if we look at this, is equal to minus dkz. So you can do a change of variable and come up with this other identity, which is minus i over 2 dkz, because of the minus sign here, okay, h0, 1, k rho, rho, e to the i, k, c, c, okay? But what is this contour c? What is this contour c? Now is, this is the, the kz integration. The kz integration should be an integration on this plane now. Okay. Originally, this integration was on the Sommerfeld integration part that we talked about last time. It looks something like this. Okay, Sommerfeld defined that to be his integration part. Or actually, we did not name it after himself. We named it after him. Okay, Sommerfeld integration part. And this path will map to a different path on the complex KZ plane. Now this is an integration on the complex KZ plane. Okay. Would it be on the real axis of the complex KZ plane? No, right? If you have a complex variable, if you do a change of variables, you have to find the map. You have to find where this path map to, this SIP maps to on a complex KZ plane, okay? But we can do something clever, right? which is that if this had been the sum of an integration path, we can say that integrating along this path is the same as integrating along this path. If I were to integrate along that path, it would have been the same as integrating along this path, wrapping around this one, going in this direction, wrapping around the branch cut in this manner, and then meeting up with this path again, okay? I can see that integration along the ice IP is the same as integration along that path. Everybody agrees. And what theorem do I invoke in order to say that the two are equal? Cauchy's theorem, right? There's no singularity, no pole <coughs> between the two paths. The only pole we have, the only singularity we have was a logarithmic singularity, and the other singularity is a branch point singularity. This is called the branch point singularity, which is this one over there. Okay, and I do not have any of the singularities in between, so these two paths are the same. <coughs> But I wouldn't prove it, but by Jordan's lemma, you can show that this contribution is equal to zero. This contribution is also equal to zero. You can show that. And you can look up the handbook what Jordan's lemma say. And then show that that two integrations are equal to zero, which means that integration along here is the same as integration along here. Okay. But this path just means the integration in this negative direction. Because I just show you that this thing maps to this converse direction, so integrating like this must be 
in the converse direction. So by contour deformation, by contour deformation, you can show that this is equal to that. And you can show that uh, the contour deformation works differently when z is larger than 0 compared to when z is less than 0. Okay? So finally, if you do the contour deformation correctly, the magnitude sign goes away. And this is a very important identity also. Okay, and to go from here to here, you have to do contour deformation. You have to do contour deformation in the manner I have described. Yes. Uh, can you uh, use the uh, bottom uh, squares to integrate? Okay, that's a very good question. Can I use the bottom one to integrate? Uh, it's kind of difficult because of this branch point over here. I cannot detour to the bottom one. Okay, and I can show that uh, you can only deform to the top one. For that reason, okay. I can, you can also show that you have to do it for two cases, z larger than zero and z less than zero. And for those two cases, um, then the the minus sign, the magnitude sign will go away. But this thing is very important. Okay, this identity is very important. Um, I try to, in the homework, convince you that this thing is complete. And this actually follows from the whale identity. And this is complete in the xy plane. This is complete in the, as a function of rho. But this thing is complete in the z-axis. If you have a function of z, you know that if you have a function of z, all functions of z's can be expanded with this function over here. Okay, so the completeness axiom is very important in matching boundary conditions. So this identity is very important in solving problems like optical fiber, where you put a source there, the z-axis is there, and then you have cylindrical layers like this. In order to match boundary conditions, you have to use this identity, not this one. Okay, this is very good for planarly layered medium that we will show later on that. If you put a source there, and your row axis is there, and by making use of this completeness of this function, you can match boundary conditions from layer to layer. And there are papers where actually people try to use this identity to solve this problem. Okay, it's a very common mistake. Even common mistake made by big professors. Okay, and, but that's wrong. So if you don't do that, that identity cannot be used to solve this problem. Okay, and you cannot use these identities to solve this problem. Can you repeat why? It's because of the completeness of this function in the z-axis, z-direction. It's because of the completeness of this function in the xy plane. Okay, let's do some examples and then we'll come across quite quick. Okay, let's do some examples and see why we cannot do certain things the way that some people have done them. Done them. Okay, the way they have done them is completely wrong. Okay, let's do some examples. In the case of a electrical dipole field. We know that E field is related to the current where yeah, this the Green's function that you have learned in chapter one. where the static Green's function has the form of 
I plus del del over k naught squared in three spaces, this is the I k naught R minus R prime. Okay, you learn this right from Michael Chow and hopefully from other courses as well. This is called the dyadic Green's function, and given a source, you can always calculate the field. But let's do just point sources alone to make things simple. Let's confine ourselves to point sources that look something like this. For the Hertzian dipole score, okay, this is a Hertzian dipole source. They can be described in this manner. And this Hertzian dipole is pointing in an alpha hat direction. That's what this alpha hat means. Okay, why is this a Hertzian dipole source? If you take two dipoles, and this is how Mr. Hertz first make this dipole, which is using two spheres and then try to charge these two spheres up. And this would be just the dipole. The dipole moment P would be Q times L, L being the distance between the two charges. Okay. That is the definition of the dipole moment that we learned from the undergraduate days. But let's assume that this dipole charges are being swapped around by an AC source. You may drive this with an AC source and then this thing keeps swapping around. Then the current I Okay, I will be dq dt, which will be something like uh, in the frequency domain, I omega q. Okay? So, I can say that um, I can say that then uh, j So, so if I look at this function then, I can say that j of r prime is actually equal to alpha i omega q l delta r prime. Delta r prime just means that this is completely localized. So this is actually due to a time varying Hertzian dipole. So you can think of this as being a time varying Hertzian dipole and that contributes to a current I that flows in between this thing. Okay, but you want to describe this to be a localized thing. So you describe it this manner. And everything comes up to be correct. What is the dimension of this direct alpha function? What is its dimension? Dimension S. What? Dimension S. Oh, direct alpha function is not dimension. You should learn this from your signal processing course, right? Yes? One over length q. Right? If you have something like delta t, the dimension of this is one over time. Because you know that this is true. It's equal to one. This is dimensionless. This is time. So we know that this is true. So this must have a dimension of one over length. But this is just a shorthand notation for this. When you write something like this, that just means that. So this must have the dimension of one over length q. Okay? And then this has a dimension of length. So the whole thing has a dimension of one over length squared. And this is the dimension of Coulomb. So this has a dimension of uh, one over time. So it has exactly exactly the dimension of current density. Coulombs per second per meter squared. Okay, so the dimension comes up to be correct. So this is a correct description of a Hertzian dipole. It is completely localized, assuming this dipole is very, very much smaller than the wavelength. Then you can make this approximation. This is completely localized, and you can approximate that Hertzian dipole as such.
Okay. So then we know how to actually approximate the field due to a Hertzian dipole. If we plug that current in, then the Hertzian dipole field will look something like this. E to the i k0 r over 4 pi r. I'm just plugging this in there, dot over alpha, and I have already done the r prime integration and using the shifting property of the data function, and I only have this left. Okay, so I can write this in a number of ways, and I can uh, do some very simple cases for how the dipoles or how the dipole field should look like if the alpha is pointing in different directions. I can make it horizontal, I can make it vertical, I can make it an incline. But let me not do all cases. If I know how to do vertical, I know how to do horizontal. The other cases are just linear superpositions of these cases. But then, you know this is a field due to Hertzian dipole. Then the magnetic field by Maxwell's equation is curl of E over I omega mu, right? That is the <coughs> magnetic field. And hence, if you take the curl of this expression, the second term goes, where does it go, the second term? What does it become if you take the curl of the second term? Right? Zero. Zero, right? This is the gradient of a divergence. This is actually, I put the divergence dot over there. Okay, this is actually the gradient of a divergence. So it goes to zero, and then you would have just equal to this cancel so of alpha e to the i k naught r 